This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Click in the description to get your two months free right now. The image of two boys over a broken city while playing Icelandic post-rock. That's the starting point for Terror in Resonance, which was part of an experimental slot for Fuji TV, a project that was in development for three years. Mappa returns with Kazuto Nakasawa as the character designer and chief animation director just like old times. The style of the designs are contemporary, going for one of the youngest audiences we've seen yet. I remember hearing somewhere that Watanabe gave like the younger staff members more leverage because of it. It's set in a modern day Japan, a, a real world setting, down to its use of highly rendered Tokyo backdrops, that super clean and polished look to go with them. Terror and Resonance is a psychological thriller, with a mystery that builds upon itself with new factors, questionable past, and a group of young terrorists. Sphinx, who wear their Sentai masks to protect their identities. It's supposed to be shocking that these teenagers are waging war. So shocking that the Chinese Minister of Culture banned the show. Sphinx's first terrorist attack is raw. There's a methodical approach to it all. How can you crumble this building? Thinking about how many explosives they need, where to place them, how to evacuate the building and distract people to get the work done. As the crew said, we had a weekly script meeting which gradually turned into something like a terrorist planning session. This sells the fact that this is no elevated planes of Mars. We're in the real standard anime world. You know, promoting their attacks on the internet in a game show way. Like they're the Riddler, throwing clues at the audience. If you don't catch on, boom. For the first couple of episodes, it's an effective setup. We're jolted through the fast paced frantic moments with big payoffs. There's this ambiguous morality to the terrorists, an old rugged detective deciphering their elaborate schemes while unraveling the tapestry of why this is all happening in the first place. It's a war of generations against conformity. The terrorist group while radical do have a lot of younger fans as they're seen as taking down the Japanese rigid system through the power of riddles, of course. The issues come later when the show starts to throw those ideas away. Even when introducing the Japanese riddles, despite being a bit vague for a Western audience, it's still solvable. But when you get to episodes like Ready or Not, the chess game in the airport is ill-defined. The rules don't make any sense and they rely more so on passive spectacle over any psychological setup. At this point, the dynamic isn't wow. Will the police stop the bomb? Why could they be doing this? Where's the moral line? Instead, it's more of a straight up action set piece. Perhaps a choice made because there's a younger audience in mind and they wanted to put them on a roller coaster. The turning point starts at episode 5 with the introduction of a wild card named Five. She's some kind of what like white haired psycho sadist straight out of another anime who flies down from an FBI copter speaking English and doing crazy stunts. She happens to have this mysterious past with the boys and she's a superior hacker and a super special awesome antagonist for the series. From here on you're getting into that 40 anime chess. The boys are narrowly avoiding getting caught, they're putting themselves in jeopardy every episode is a bit much. If the intention was to keep it on the raw side, when they have to save another member from a remote control plane, doing it all while finding a way to stop it, not getting caught and escaping. These are two teenage boys. I don't care how enhanced they are, you can't be both James Bond and Blowfish in this style of story. Despite this, realism was at the utmost importance for Watanabe, within reason. This is the reason the plane doesn't crash into the airport, because there's a ton of precautions set up, so it would not be a likely event to happen in your uh, real life. It would also be hard to find reference for that happening. In an interview, the writers mentioned they were having a hard time understanding the characters, in particular Lisa, a bullied friendless child with problems at home who feels compelled to run away, the ideal radical candidate, treating her better than anyone else. They could slowly condition her to do more outrageous things. As a character, Lisa gets a fair bit of criticism, and I'm not sure if it's all fair. She's just a regular girl, who's a bit inept and obviously damaged. Of course she can't compare against the ubermensch twins over here, but um, she's an audience stand-in for the world of super young hacker terrorists. Although as the show goes on, her importance wavers and the boys get the focus, becoming a damsel in distress instead. Her relationship with Twelve grows throughout. Twelve sees parallels in her abuse and their own, and grows attached. He needs the companionship of someone maybe a little warmer than his associate, let's say. This leads to all matter of dramatic conflicts between Nine and Twelve. Twelve is willing to risk it all for his first friend, and after the trauma of losing everyone else, he just can't stand the thought of that happening again. I mean, moreover, he's a teenager and Lisa's a girl, you can do the math there. 
Yet something feels off. I do wonder if Lisa is there to fill a producer quota, to be the cute girl, as we've stated, stapled onto the show. After all, it is the boy's story. The dynamic between the trio has always been splintered. It's a duo plus one. Both boys are ambiguous, at first. They never get a ton of development. Nine is serious and cold, and 12 is goofy and a little sadistic. Although Tara is less character orientated, it's more about the ideas. No surprise the trio aren't as playful as Watanabe's prior shows, even if that's his speciality. In the end, Lisa's true purpose seems to be remembering what happened. She had a front view of it all, who these two really were. In a situation where speculation is most of what exists, the two experiments that escaped. As the story unfolds, it's revealed that Sphinx did not kill anyone, or they don't plan to kill anyone. This choice seemed weird and clashed with the production at the beginning. At first, Watanabe was alright with the idea of them killing, but there was an assessment that it would be bad for the audience to see killing as justified, so this was changed. As naive as it is to assume none of these events killed anyone, no one died in the collateral, especially that final one, the aftermath would have been devastating for weeks, not dissimilar to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and that's something that makes the premise of the show bite harder, especially if it came out when it was intentionally made to. They build off that tension on the nuclear question. The Abe administration has talked at length about rearming Japan, abolishing the Article 9, and moreover, the right to nuclear weapons. It's a contentious issue in Japan, and Watanabe wanted the young generation to think about it, whatever side of the discussion they end up on. I mean, there could be more, but I'm an outsider, so uh, I don't have all the context. At the end of the show, we discover that the nuclear bomb was developed by the Japanese government surreptitiously. It's not a show about terrorism. That isn't high on the priority list within Japan. Most of them see that as something that happens in countries far away. But around issues of entrapment of its citizens, human rights violations, burying evidence, those are more relevant to modern Japan than ever. The experiments on the innocents in a prison type situation, as well as the cover up of it all, that just seems more appropriate in the end of the day. Some of the show excels though, is the music. It's one of Kano's finest, which at this point is like a broken record. Yeah, I get it, she's legendary. The album does bring something different though. They stuck to the, the Icelandic melodic post-rock roots with splatters of jazz. At times, it's like a lost Sigaros cassette. Watanabe even approached them if they wanted to do the show, but it was a little too expensive for their budget. Considering what we got in the end, not the worst outcome. Lolol is a visceral guitar lead full of distortion, creating loops of chaos, only building the longer it's played. A melody that starts appearing through the noise as a reflection to how it only plays in relation to their abusive past. Hannah brings contrast to the overt action and delivers on the subtler emotional side, better than I expect from the uh, second half of the show. But the music is always great. Bon, now this is the main piece. Sad, beautiful, sparse, the way it's used in episode nine, exemplary. The onslaught of the timer, the hopelessness next to the beauty of the night, or what about the right at the end, at the most dramatic point, when they start bringing in the lyrics? I had to. Von means hope, and in the second act, you start to see how it is bringing comfort from a cold place. They were able to capture that sound by traveling to Iceland themselves, resurrecting the soul of ambient post-rock in the process. Terror in Resonance was originally planned as a film. You can see an outline in the first four episodes with the ending too. They line up quite nicely. The middle sections where it gets a bit padded and distracted. Maybe a long movie which focused on the view from one character's lens could have made the message a bit more potent. The reveal of their plans don't hit as hard if there's no ambiguity in the character arc. If you're going to threaten the proposition of nuclear Armageddon, you better, you better know what you're doing. But what do I know? The show left a splash in 2014. It has its fans. Although in terms of Watanabe's work, it's not the kind of show I'd associate with him in the long run. I don't know if it will be remembered among the other titans. At least Watanabe was trying to push beyond his comfort zone, encouraging younger generations to think about current events. He was happy with the results, and it must be nice to see a project that was three years in the working finally come together. Though it couldn't have been the easiest production, as this isn't the only show that Watanabe made in 2014. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. 
You can explore classes in everything from filmmaking, creative writing, to animation, and much more. Premium memberships give you unlimited access to high quality classes from experts working in those fields to help you gain new skills to be the best creator you can be. It's also incredibly affordable at an annual subscription being less than $10 a month. I've been checking out this course recently and it's gonna be very important for the content I'm making going forward. Going viral, film and make content. I've skimmed the series in the past, but now I need to deep dive in to get some of those tools, tips and tricks to help me with future projects, which will be dealing with different obscure topics that might not catch as easily. So click in the description to get two months of Skillshare free right now. Come on, you, you know you want it. A lingering thought, a promotional video appears announcing a new sci-fi show from Watanabe. You can't escape it. Biba. This will be it, the second coming. The band members are getting back together. Nobumoto, Yoko Kano, Dai Sato, the team at Bones. What's more, there's all these guest directors and animators. You get the picture, it's a super group of creative talent. Will it bring back the feeling of my youthful days? Please? Yet upon its release, while watching its first episode, I felt deflated. This isn't Bebop, it's crass, immature, and beyond stupid. Some might call it the stupidest anime ever made. Why are my outrageously specific expectations not being met? Am I like Kotaku? Is it the comedy that's not doing it for me? I mean, that's something that's hard to nail down at the best of the times, especially not when you're trying to go through a language barrier too. The 80-20 split for humor and seriousness, that's the complete opposite of what Bebop was trying. Maybe it has something to do with that lack of consequences. The first episode ends with every character dying in an explosive burst of animation fury. Well, I gotta say, it's, it's neither. Upon rewatching the show and getting past the first episode, soaking in that dandy experience, I came out the other side reborn. If this is part three in Watanabe's episodic trilogy about the adventures of outcast losers through collaged culture, then it shall receive the crown. It may be my favorite or a close match for the show that put him on the map. So how did I get from dropping it to crowning it? Going back to that Kotaku article, it captures a sentiment of some disgruntled fans. Upon the show's silly nature, it's pulp sci-fi vibe represented in its opening right there. And among that, Watanabe stated that one of his core inspirations was the 1974 film Dark Star, which is about a bunch of doofuses in space trying to get their lame jobs done. It kind of started that whole space trucker aesthetic, which was pushed further by other 70s sci-fi films. But Dandy's aesthetic is nowhere close to worn down or rustic. It presents a vibrant world full of extravagant aliens with a complete lack of self-respect. Just like the Pulp Fiction. A point brought up in the why I'm unable to enjoy Space Dandy is the show's lack of causation for death or continuity, and that can leave the show without impact. Yet, that it doesn't have narrative conventions is to me what makes it so compelling and different. Anything can happen. When we see the gag at the end of the interdimensional episode, you could kind of believe that the next episode would just have a different cast, because why not? The show revels in no rules. Without those strands of story, it would be a straight up anthology show. The creative freedom is outstanding, with each team of creative artists, writers, directors coming together to push the sci-fi anime genre further, beyond genre even. At least that's what Manami the producer is saying he wants to do. As genre hopping as Bebop could be, I never expected to see the crew join a band or feature in a high school musical or spend a whole episode in a purgatory fantasy land where everyone talks like dead philosophers repeating their own cliff notes. So let's get into the real examples, baby. Episodes like Plants Are Living Things Too by Yung Yong Choi changed everything around the show's look. Character designs were thrown out and adjusted to support the director's style, preparing you for something distinct especially when you recognize those creators, that's quite cathartic. The backgrounds in this episode come from Aymeric Kevin, a French animator and art designer who spent more than four months doing the job for this episode alone. And it really helps give a cerebral tone to the whole show, which is already full of atmosphere. A story half told, only a snapshot into this world before it all disappears. Would we be better off without the knowledge that makes us live in societies? 
Is this ever-expanding world of conquest and higher profits going to eat itself faster than they can stop it? Do we need a new beginning? <laughs> I mean, all Dandy takes from it is... I gotta say, I'm fine if I never see another plant. <laughs> Masaki Yuasa's outing is far less thoughtful, but no less beautiful. A sappy milled chasing event, like Wallace and Gromit on acid. Yuasa's staple runarounds are here, the crew look to get a bite to eat, but doom a whole race of aliens in the process. You know, it's standard stuff. The spurned ex-fish who gets burnt by his uh, significant other and is then almost burnt by a whole planet. It's just absurdity taken form, but let's put a pin in that for now. From fish planets to fishing on a planet, this big fish is huge, baby. That's one hell of an episode. Kiyotaka Oshiyama is a key animator on several Ghibli projects, and this is his baby. It tells an adventurous fable meets sci-fi tale. Kaven once stated that whenever Oshiyama is given free reign, they return to man against nature, primal cultures striking a balance with their ecosystems, fighting for survival. You can definitely tell the Ghibli in that. And this story is in itself like a woodblock print come alive with wavy animation to present this charming, self-contained story with some really catchy music, especially that chanting part right here. Yeah, yeah I can dig it. You know, at times, if Dandy wasn't so pulp, it would be considered art house. It uses his energy to knock you off guard, low-blowing you with its thoughtfulness. As the show would say, that's kind of deep in a rambling, stupid kind of way. So how would you go about writing such a late-night anime? Well, it all starts with the group meetings. The writers get together, and they spitball, they shoot the breeze about the ideas, while Watanabe would guide the conversation and help them along. Each writer gets their ideas in, and they flesh it out, and it can go wherever. Some writers were award-winning sci-fi novelists, others hadn't even seen Star Wars. From what I'm told, there were two meetings and then you gotta finish the script. You got about a week to write it, but after the first meetings, you've basically got a whole structure to work with. It might start with an idea like, hey, I wanna do zombies, and then erupt from there. Like his prior episodic series, the synergy in the writing room helps elevate the wackier ideas. It's a natural progression, and I'm sure the music isn't too far off that, which isn't the standard affair. It's a combination point of many of his contexts in the industry, giving him this orchestra level amount of uh, people to work with. With the only kind of caveat being that he wanted to make sure all the instruments they were using came out before 1984 to create that sort of disco electric funk soundtrack that Dandy's really going for. It's got to be a little old school, it's got to be a little retro. It's so wide and vast, it's great work, even if it's not as cohesive as the prior OST. You could argue neither is the show, so it makes sense the music would relate. The ED was so good upon uh, hearing it the first time, I had to look it up straight away, and what would you know, it was Yoko Kano, along with someone else who, who was actually pretty good too. It tends to use its big musical pieces to strike it on its poignant or explosive moments, bringing them to new levels, even if they're completely whack. Say for example, that point where they were intergalactically surfing through a city pop landscape of cool, with the help of junk Fujiyama. At that point, they're missing out on bounties, and that just becomes the average pastime of Dandy's crew. The narrative morphs into something completely outside where it starts. It doesn't really care about payoff, meaningful stakes. Our trio dynamic this time is super skewed, consisted of three complete idiots. Worst among their peers, dumber than a pile of bricks. They're all suited to what they do, and the show even jokes about it. But you learn to like them. It even gets more reflective with each of them than you'd think it would. Dandy especially gets a lot of that from the conceit of what he can do that no one else can. Now, in a trilogy of posts, Blartooth Demand talks about how Dandy is the extreme of this episodic trilogy and pushes it to its limits in all directions. The natural progression. It has so little cohesion that uh, you wouldn't think there's like an overarching thing that keeps it all together. And while it might look like there's no umbrella, it's a trick. There is one tying theme, and it's something that the blogger brought up himself. Space Dandy is the master of absurdism. Now, what is absurdism? It's a strand of philosophy developed by Albert Camus. It kind of asks the question, how do we confront the absurd? And his answer was that it would be to form an act of resistance against it, against the universe. He does this by looking at the myth of Sisyphus, which is also the name of the book that this was first conjured in. This guy was a cursed king that would roll a boulder up a hill, only for it to roll back down again at the end of every day. 
You could say that Camus saw this as an allegory for modern life. It doesn't surprise me that Dandy took that silly, absurdist sort of tale, because it's a very comedic thing to do. And Dandy likes to play with serious sci-fi concepts with one hand and then throw them in the bin with the other, then laugh at something like a robot drinking coffee instead. I do believe this sort of helps us understand where the first episode was coming from. Even though it spends a lot of time plodding around, setting up its world, characters and origins, with a bit of meta-commentary here and cheesecake there, we do get a complete picture of Dandy as a character. He's introduced by the speech where he gives his philosophy on his love and admiration for the booty. Yet he spends all his time in Space Hooters. He's a walking contradiction, even to his own outlook. A character without baggage. Dandy sways in the wind like a leaf in the breeze, going wherever he wants, doing whatever, always adapting. Even when fighting against existential dread, not knowing if you exist or if you're a copy. In the end, Dandy takes the ultimate absurdist path. Drowning in the introspection he couldn't even spell, he grasped at answers. And then, as it all went black, he found one. No. Who cares, baby? Complete acceptance. What about the time he became a zombie? At first, there was a sort of depression over him about the concept of being continuously rotting, but there's no cure. But in time, he sort of comes to recontextualize that to be fermenting. So his undead life becomes a lot more smooth, which does remind me of the concept that Camus brought up about Sisyphus, that what if he could find joy in rolling that rock up the hill? Either way, he has to do it, so he might as well find a way to make that work for him. Sometimes the show just throws an absurdist twist on you just to, uh, you know, kick you off your sails. In the racing episode, you think, oh, Dandy is going to win, but in the end, he's actually teleported millions of years into the future where he becomes a transcending mythic figure. If he won the race or not, it's now completely irrelevant. Though what we can say is he's lost everything he ever was. That's a, that's a strange take on wacky races in space, so I'll say it myself. If that wasn't enough, later in the series, there's this bombshell dropped at our feet that the warp drive they've been using to travel around, it doesn't move around space, but dimension. The only person who knows this and experiences all realities at once is none other than Space Dandy. So not only are all the contradictions in the show connected, but so are all the dandies. Dandy could only live the way he does without losing his mind by following the go with the flow mentality, jumping through different existences, remembering everyone's possibilities and how they merge together. A hundred lives lived in a moment. So you could say Dandy pushes away from being an unaware idiot to a fully aware character fleeing nihilism. And you could see that maybe in a character like emo Dandy or depressed Dandy, who while he's my spirit animal, in his universe, his existence has become too much for him to cope. He's constantly battling with that feeling of suicide, even if he does spend all his time drinking nutritional drinks. I mean, I don't think Dandy would have it any other way. Now, our Dandy would never consider such a thing, as he said in a certain episode. You know, once you've ended it, that's all. He is a no-go suicide boy, which aligns with the absurdist principles, which as a whole reject that concept. And in a, in a twist that I could only expect from Space Dandy, that emo Dandy is the only one to survive, is just the cherry on top of the outcome. Now let's get into the actual episode where our Dandy happens to die. To go to Limbo. It's a very different styled episode, much more melancholic and surrealist. It seems to tackle those uh, conundrums of the dead white philosophers real well, if you know what I'm talking about. It was actually inspired by an Edgar Allan Poe story, The Mask of Red Death, which is about a gentleman trying to escape the plague, and he happens to go into the sort of, I guess you'd call it Victorian, like ball where everyone is there, but ultimately they all die. It's all futile, you know, just like living. You can't escape it. Oh, one of the little touches musically that I love in this episode is the way they use Paphony of a Dead Princess as not only as a subtle indicator of what happened to Dandy, but also as a callback to Aurorian Dance from Champloo, which derives its original sample from a cover of this song. And of course, Revel, the composer, was a French dandy himself, so it all seems to just fit right into place. Now, many of the people that Dandy confronts in this limbo, called Poe, they, uh, they tell him that sadness doesn't exist here and that he should stay. But Dandy counters with happiness can't exist without sadness. To not confront this will be in itself hiding in complete denial. There are some people in this world who've been living hundreds of years and can't even remember the way they died. And when Dandy finds out it, it's a ungraceful way to go, which seems fitting for his core tenants. 
Some decide that hedonism is the way that they can survive in this world, spouting concepts of living in denial. Others completely embrace nihilism. In the end, Dandy takes his own perspective on it, which is none of theirs. As he says, dead or alive, I'm still Dandy. Complete acceptance once again. While he escapes this episode, many other dandies do not. His perspective is still that of the absurdist king. This episode also helps uh, foreshadow a difficult decision needed to be made in the conclusion. For the whole series, to fight the horrors of existence, Dandy pushes back. And this is most solidified when Dandy takes his own lead in denying a chance of godhood. When the universe collapses and god can no longer exist, he is given the opportunity. But that just doesn't fly with the beat of Dandy's own drum. He'd rather everything goes back to the way it was, in effect creating a time loop, an Ouroboros, very similar to a Sisyphus situation where Dandy will push that rock all the way up for it just to tumble back down to the beginning. And you know what? He seems just dandy about it. Real wonderful. Though I guess I'm prone to absurdist fiction more than the average person. Back in university, I had a, a habit of coming in at the start of the day and procrastinating by writing little absurdist stories with other people in the room. Sure, you could say that Bebop is structured to be more profound by its end, all coming together with that ambiguous ending, the music, the many verbose moments, where it really sells it to you. Dandy on the other side spits in the face of the profound, offering up moments of grandeur just to reject them for cheap laughs. And that's what makes it such a unique product that could only exist because of the power of Watanabe. To sell such an idea from anyone else with that many tonal shifts, ideas and crew, outlandish. So it's sad to say that Dandy did not do so well on its release. In an article by Jacob Chapman, he argues for the factors behind it. As critically acclaimed as the series was, it did not light the fire the team were hoping for. Maybe it has something to do with his experimental episodic anthology setup, which wasn't the rage with the kids, I can say that much. I'm hoping to know it will be one day. In his article, he argues that one of the core tenets that might have affected it is that Dandy, as a character, is more of a Japanese archetype, and that may have pushed fans away not used to that kind of setup, especially the nerds. Since he's both, at the beginning, rude and dumb, instead of smart and blood, like in a another series uh, that also has absurdist tendencies that may or may not be named. I mean, I'll, I'll be fair here, like, Rick and Morty's absurdism has got nothing on dandies. Yeah, I know how that must sound, you know, you need to be a certain intelligent to understand how stupid dandy is and why that's genius, but I digress. It was trying to hit that, that uh, international audience real hard. It started the simul dubbing trend, though I do wonder if this series would have been a better hit if it was streaming at the same time. And this is a route Adult Swim seems to be going down themselves as they combine with Crunchyroll to increase their overall audience potential. Even Watanabe's newer works have went the way of streaming. Speaking of which, Blade Runner Blackout. We've done it, we've came full circle. One of the works that inspired the director to begin with is now something that he is working on. His own tiny little short in the universe. How is it? Uh, I mean, that's all right. It's a pretty tribute to the original, but to me it feels more like a set piece than its own little story. Say, for example, like the Animatrix. There's some great animation and beautiful choreography by Bahi JD. Moreover, the soundtrack by Lotus was what a wonderful choice for that contemporary jazz electronic sound. Man, those guys should work together more often. Oh, look at that, they did. This Flying Lotus music video that he did. It encourages me because it seems to show that Watanabe is always willing to try new things and push into places he's not comfortable in, as well as working with different talent, pushing forward those relationships, which I hope he continues to do in his later works, including that one I'm going to talk about soon. And there you have it, the so far career of one of the finest collaborators in the anime sphere. If you haven't seen some of his shows, check him out. I'm hoping I convinced you, especially Space Dandy. Stay safe, everyone, and love you. Thanks for all the support. And maybe we'll talk about his next project another time. And no, I'm not talking about the live action Bebop TV series. See you, Space Cowboys.